Hello, and thank you everybody for attending the afternoon session. So my name is Thorsten Kort, and I'm an application performance specialist at NERSC, and my day-to-day -day work is helping scientists to optimize their codes for uh, contemporary supercomputer systems. Today I'm going to talk about a project uh, I care about because it combines three different things I'm excited about. This is uh, big computers, so exascale, it's deep learning, and it's climate change because it will affect everybody, uh, every one of us, sooner or later. So this is a team effort, and uh, I want to thank at this point everybody in this collabor uh, collaborative effort between NERSC, NVIDIA, UC Berkeley, and Oak Ridge uh, for making this a success. So thank you at this point. So what I want to talk about are extreme weather phenomena. So why are they important? They're important because they can incur a lot of damage and uh, loss of life and these kind of things. For example, 2017, the, um, the uh, damage to the US economy was about like 200 billion for like the combined uh, um, uh, extreme weather events. So these can be hurricanes or tropical cyclones and for example, atmospheric rivers because they can cause heavy flooding and a major disruption. So, uh, we want to understand these events better, but what the typical climate data analysis is, so for example, you have these, uh, these simulations which look into the future like up to 100 years. You run different models and get, get these, uh, so on, the, uh, on your left you see these, these, the output of these simulations. And they basically contain like 14 million observables for a three hour interval, and then you have like 100 years worth of that. So, and what people usually do when you look at the IPCC report, for example, or like in uh, popular magazines, they boil it down to a couple of numbers. For example, uh, temperature rise, sea level rise, these kind of things. However, if the temperature increases by one degree uh, or two, that, that matters, that might not matter to you if you live in the middle of the Sahara, right? It might matter to you though if you are in different uh, regions of the globe and also the sea level rise. So the thing is now, what you want to do is you want to have a geospatial um, analysis of climate change. So how does climate change impact your life where you live? So we want to answer things like, uh, will there be more hurricanes, for example? Uh, and if yes, will they be more intense? Will they make more landfall? So if they stay over the sea, it's usually not as bad as when they hit the coastline. And um, for atmospheric rivers, for example, 50% of all rain in California is due to atmospheric rivers. So it's, it, it's a nice, uh, it's an important question to ask if we will get more water, like more rain, uh, due to this. When you, for example, think about forest fires, like the campfire last year we had in the Bay Area, we had a hard time breathing like for two weeks. Um, it's really a question if you get more or fewer of these, and it's really dependent on, on these atmospheric rivers, for example. So insurance industry, uh, like, um, uh, for example, water planners, and like a lot of like, different people need to know what they uh, need to gear up for. So how can we do this? So we have these high, high, uh, high fidelity climate simulations and what we, for example, can start with, like picking out the, these events. For example, uh, hurricanes, atmospheric rivers. Let's start with these. And uh, you know that image segmentation techniques uh, can offer like pixel level resolution. So they can do a per pixel classification to pick these, uh, these events out and then correlate them uh, geospatially with the underlying like region, for example. Uh, and deep learning, as you know, is very successful in here because, for example, the whole autonomous driving industry is, is, is doing that day in, day out. And uh, there's a lot of like, uh, research going on in this direction. So the data set we have is uh, of 20 terabytes. So we have like 400 terabyte in storage, but for this uh, work we use 20 terabytes of it. And what I call an image here is more like a, a tensor. It's a three-dimensional tensor of this 1152 uh, times 768 times 16. And the channels uh, are not RGB, They're, they represent uh, observables like wind speed, um, temperature, pressure, um, for different altitudes, uh, and these kind of things. So they're like, uh, like general observables. Uh, we have three classes, so background, which is not, nothing interesting going on, uh, then the tropical cyclones, hurricanes, uh, and atmospheric rivers. Fortunately, these events are still rare in the future. So 95% uh, of the pixels are background, which is good for us, but it's like harder uh, to train the model on that because of this high imbalance. Uh, and another thing which makes it different from like the classical, like say, street scene segmentation is that all the objects here are, uh, so first there's a lot of stuff going on in the background. It's not like static or slow moving. And also the objects themselves, they change uh, uh, rapidly in, in size and shape, right? So even when you look at this image, uh, this, this uh, satellite image from a hurricane, as a, as, even as an expert, you don't know actually where you want to say like uh, where this hurricane ends, uh, starts or ends, right? So like, the labels are pretty fuzzy. 
So talking about that, how did we get those? Of course, the best would be using human annotated labels, but uh, for that data, we didn't have that at the time. We are currently working on that, though. So for this effort, we use some algorithmic labeling, uh, which is an old school approach in the sense that uh, it's basically based on feature engineering uh, uh, together with some thresholding to get the binary masks. Um, one can say, okay, why don't, you, uh, why don't you do the predictions with these algorithms then? Because you have a lot of shortcomings in this algorithm. So they are regional dependent, they, like even uh, for different thresholds, get vastly different labels. So, uh, however, they're still good enough to fit in your network with it and it can pick up better features, as I will show uh, you later. So for the image segmentation architecture, we picked the uh, Deep Lab version 3 plus variant. So uh, it was developed by Google uh, and basically has an, as all these segmentation network has an encoder which extracts the features um, and the decoder part which then makes the predictions and the skip connections in order to feed like the features at different levels from the encoder stage into the decoder to improve the prediction uh, quality. So the original Deep Lab had a bilinear interpolation as a uh, as a decoder, and we replaced this uh, with a fully deconvolutional decoder. I think the origin choice was made for uh, training reasons because it's, more, uh, it's easier to train this bilinear interpolator because it doesn't have a lot of weights. So our model has like 44.7 uh, million parameters, and the training cost for a single step on a single sample, so forward, backward, is 14.4 uh, teraflop, which is 14.4 uh, times 10 to the 12 floating point operations. And on a modern GPU, like this NVIDIA uh, V100, you can only fit two batches in half precision or one in single precision on, this, um, uh, on the GPU. So what you need to do is you need to do a, a train it in parallel. And we took a purely uh, data parallel approach here. Um, so we used Horovod for this. So Horovod is basically a, a framework which hooks into the tensor for gra graph in asynchronous fashion and uh, reduces tensors across all the workers uh, as they are like, ready to, to be reduced. It uh, does this using MPI, so it, it provides MPI callback function. MPI, so the mes message passing interface, uh, is a very common framework for uh, exchanging uh, messages uh, between different, like uh, in a distributed memory system, like, such as HPC systems. The good thing is that since a lot of people in HPC use it, it's very highly optimized usually for these supercomputers. You're still, of course, responsible for sharding your data set, distribute the data, and all these kind of things. So we ran on the Summit supercomputer system. So this is the number one supercomputer in the world. Uh, so there's this top 500 list, which is updated twice a year. Um, so this is a system at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. It consists of 4,600 nodes. Uh, it has like two power uh, uh, CPUs in them and six uh, NVIDIA V100 GPUs with tensor cores. Um, they are connected using this high-speed uh, NVLink interconnect, which is very nice. So we can do this all reductions uh, in this within a node very efficiently. And um, it also features 800 gigabyte of non-volatile memory per node, which is quite cool because you can stage part of your data set into that and read it almost with uh, DRAM speed. So it's, it's almost uh, as fast as reading it from main memory, but it's much bigger. Uh, so the network is pretty fast and low latency. And what I want to point out here, though, is that uh, we talk a lot, uh, a lot about like exascale computing, so, 10 to the, so capability of 10 to the 18 floating point operations per second in double precision. So we, we are like, uh, so this is the next generation of uh, systems we want to deploy or want to uh, like develop and deploy. But when you look at it, in half, if, you, if you can stick with half precision, so if you can basically have, have an application which can utilize half precision uh, um, almost like for most of the uh, computations, you have an exascale system available right now. So it's there, it's in Oak Ridge, you can just go and use it. So there are some performance optimizations necessary, of course. Um, so when you think about like deep learning, you have to like you have to train, you have to optimize the whole pipeline, right? Starting from like the data, where do you where do you read it from? Where do you stage it in? And then how do you feed it efficiently to your accelerator, right? The accelerators are so fast that you need to feed them efficiently that they don't uh, stall waiting for that data. For the computational part, you want to uh, minimize the data reorganization, for example, and the reductions also need to be very efficient, right? Because uh, you want to reduce uh, the gradients uh, like uh, at, a, at a very very high frequency. Uh, one thing we also used was uh, some uh, overlapping or like gradient pipelining or stale synchronous approach, you call it. We do not reduce the gradients, uh, the, uh, the, the, we do not compute the fresh gradients and reduce them and then integrate them, but instead you, you uh, come on the GPU, you compute the uh, fresh gradients, and then on the CPU, you read the, old, the gradients from the last step from a buffer, reduce those asynchronously to the computation of the new gradients and integrate them into the model. So by that you can overlap these kind of uh, like these two steps very nicely. So this is a plot for the performance we got. So you see the throughput metric of images per second, or call it samples per second. Um, 
versus the number of GPUs. Uh, if you divide it by six, you get the number of nodes. And uh, the, uh, the, the other y-axis is basically a translation of this image per second throughput metric into like a more HPC metric of petaflops per second, so 10 to the 15 operations per second. So what you see is the FE32, so the single precision uh, points are blue, so I don't want to talk about these. What you can see that the FP16, so the half precision performance much, much better, right? So the tensor cores can in theory deliver 125 teraflops per card. And that is what you see, you see a vast performance difference. The dashed line represents the ideal case. So in, 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 the, in the ideal case where you don't have any loss due to communication, you would be basically add on this line. So we are a bit below with the, with the solid red line, but uh, uh, not far. I think it's like 70 something percent, 79 percent scaling efficiency. And also what you see that the lagged version, so where you can basically overlap the, the computation with the communication very nicely, this is, it's very crucial to do this here because uh, the GPUs are so fast that they, they really need to wait for the all reduce otherwise. So and after we saw this, we thought, okay, we can go to a couple of more nodes, but uh, we might not still hit the exaflop mark, which is this 1,000 petaflops per second. So we restructured the decoder a little bit, uh, and uh, not, like f uh, not like from um, the um, uh, predictive power, but we re removed some additional data transpositions and re-ran it on a couple of more nodes and actually got, got there. So the performance number we got at that scale was 1.13 exaflops in FP16, uh, so half precision, on uh, 27,360 GPU, and that is so far the biggest deep learning calculation uh, I'm aware of. So this is the training loss. This is on a slightly lower scale. Um, we don't have like this full history for, for, the, for the big scale. However, what you can see, you know, uh, the case I want to make here is that this lagged version, although it's like, a, like a partially asynchronous, it's, uh, but it's like predictable asynchronous in a way that um, the network at the beginning is a bit unstable. So it, like, uh, basically the, the training loss grows or like oscillates heavily. But then when you, when you just wait long enough, it will outperform the, the unlagged version. So that, of course, is not true for every, for every arbitrary like deep learning network, but for us it's, uh, it's definitely true. And um, I think it's definitely worth a try if you have a, like a problem like that. So talking about the results, I have a video for this. So on the left-hand side, you see the predicted weather patterns by the model, and the right-hand side, you see the, uh, the ground truth. So I have three things to say. So first, uh, there's some qualitative uh, agreement and also quantitative agreement, uh, which is uh, satisfactory. What you also see is that there are more predicted events than actually in the labels. And that is because of the, um, that is mainly because the, the, the aggressive thresholding algorithm uh, t uh, sometimes forgets to, to label stuff. So when, you, when we show some of these samples where we over predict uh, atmospheric rivers, for example, to experts, they say, yes, actually the model picked up an atmospheric river, which was not present in the ground truth. And that you can also see that uh, the ground truth, you see the video is flickering. Uh, and this is because just like there's like a frame before and after where, where, it, where it, for example, picked up an atmospheric river, but a frame in between where it did not. But of course, it should be continuous. It should not be like this. So the model actually predicts something which is much more continuous and much more smooth, even if we uh, did not uh, the uh, temporal dependence into account. So that is quite interesting. So my conclusions are, uh, so TensorFlow is one of the first applications which reached exascale performance, although only in FP16, but still it's remarkable. And I think this is a community achievement. And um, HPC systems are suitable for these workloads. Uh, of course, there are some, some uh, insufficiencies, for example, the file system. So we needed this, this large on-node storage in order to feed the, the data efficiently. If you try to read from a distributed file system, it's, it's very bad because HPC file systems are optimized for writing large chunks of data but not doing random reads, okay? So uh, if you want to design an HPC system in the future, which is very suitable for deep learning, you need to take this into account. So this is also very important. And also we, we want to talk to storage people to help us to develop better like uh, distributed storage, uh, which can cope with these workflows better. So this uh, work was awarded the Gorn Bell Prize at the, um, the ACM Gorn Bell Prize at the last supercomputing conference. This prize is usually awarded uh, for like a, a, an interesting and challenging science problem which, uh, for which you need massive amounts of compute to solve it, and then you can show that you actually use this massive amount of compute efficiently to solve it. So this is the paper link. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.